Hello everybody, Dr. F. Scott Feel here, and I'd like to introduce you to our newest sponsor. The NPTE Final Frontier is the review course that I wish was around when I took the board exam. For those of you who know my story, it took me a handful of times to pass that exam, and quite frankly, I really wish I had an, a, an exam review course around, uh, just like the NPTE Final Frontier. Uh, check out their website, NPTEFF.com, and use the code HET at checkout for 10% off to all of our listeners and fans. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. F. Scott Field, uh, and I've got two, two folks with me today to talk about uh, a very important topic. Uh, we're going to talk about ethics in the world of academia and healthcare. Uh, I've got with me today Michael Schumacher. Schuma Shoemaker, I'll be all right, and Charles Salvo. Guys, go ahead and introduce yourself. Michael, tell us a little bit about your uh, a- your academic journey and how it's led you to where you are today. Yeah, so I'm uh, Mike Shoemaker, and I uh, graduated from Slippery Rock University back in 99, so one of the uh, earlier DPT programs long ago, and was was primarily into geriatric practice, and then kind of progressively grew my way towards cardiopulmonary practice. Um, started teaching here at Grand Valley State University in Grand Rapids, Michigan uh, in 2006 full-time. And I've, I've been here ever since. Uh, I still uh, practice at uh, a local hospital system across the street, uh, primarily cardiothoracic critical care. have been pretty heavily involved in the APTA at the chapter level uh, over the years as a legislative director, vice president, and president. Um, and so, you know, professional issues was kind of always a natural fit for me. So when I uh, started teaching here, I, I was put in charge of one of our professional topics courses, which introduces a number of different threads that we that we have throughout the curriculum. And one of those is that ethics. And so um, that's kind of been an area that I've been been teaching in uh, since I've been here. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here and excited yeah. for this discussion. Awesome. Well, Charles Salvo, tell us a little bit about your academic journey and how it led you to where you're at today. Oh, yeah. So a little unorthodox. I actually began my collegiate career uh, studying chemistry, and I finished that with a bachelor's and master's of science in chemistry um, from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, But during that time, I I knew I always wanted to work in the health field. I just didn't really know what avenue I wanted to take. So um, after some shadowing and some research, I decided physical therapy was the way I really wanted to go. Um, so I applied to University of Scranton and graduated there with a DPT degree and immediately got into geriatric practice as well following graduation. Um, so I began working in home, the home health setting and I've stayed in the home health setting. I've been working in there approximately eight and a half years. Um, and during that time, I knew I always wanted to continue my education as well, um, especially with a geriatric focus. So I I became geriatric certified as a clinician through the ABPTS and um, continued again with education with earning a, a doctoral, uh, excuse me, a, phys, a PhD degree um, in strategic leadership and administrative studies. Um, and that led me into teaching the current role that I'm at right now. And I'm teaching the professional development courses, uh, one of them being professional issues and the other being administration and management. So both dealing with ethics, um, which is what brought me in here today. Yeah, I uh, have to forewarn the audience. These guys come highly recommended in the world of ethics as uh, two of the best in the biz. So I'm excited to learn myself today uh, because ethics is one of the things that kind of threads through some of my courses as well. So I'm excited, but let's do this. Let's start off with your own personal definition of ethics. Charles, go ahead and and let us know what you think uh, the definition of ethics is. So I think there's always that formal definition, um, but when it comes to like what it really means to you, uh, very simply put, it's just to do the right thing and to always value what is important and put that ahead of what you think may be the most efficient or most um, simplistic process, especially when it comes to the world of professionalism. Yeah, I love that. I tell my kids that all the time. It's like morals and ethics are what, what you do when people aren't watching you. You know, you can be good in front of people all the time, but what about when nobody's watching? Are you still doing the right thing? Are you still doing what's what's best? You know, or, you know, what what, what we all know to be as right, you know, Michael, how about yourself? What's your uh, take on the ethics definition? Yeah, I think of it kind of as a, as I mean, what you guys are saying, it's, it's a compass, right? It's 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 something that guides you and points you in the right direction. And so I kind of think of it as both 
you know, that this, the set of rules that help guide our decision making, but also as a process to use to help decide. Um, kind of a, a, a little bit of a dual definition there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, you think golden rule, right? Just do unto others as you would have done to you. You want people to do the right thing at all times, but it's also got to come from internal. I like that a lot. You know, you need that moral compass, that thing that drives you to do the right thing and make the right decisions, you know? So uh, speaking of which, let's let's kind of dive into this next now. Why is ethics so important, especially in the field of medicine? Michael, go ahead and start us off. Oh, well, I'll, I'll start maybe even related to physical therapy. Sure. You know, ethics is important in health professions because having a code of ethics is one of those key criteria for a profession being a profession. You know, so we've had a code of ethics in PT since I think it's 1934. And, and one of the reasons that having a code of ethics is so critical for making a profession a profession is that it helps engender the public trust. And at an individual level with patients, I think it's critical because of that power differential between patients and their providers, that, that significant knowledge you know, differential, the fact that you know, healthcare or health issues are so, so personal and you know, make people vulnerable that with that power differential, there's got to be a higher standard than just do unto others as you'd have done unto you, right? There, there has to sort of be this, this higher standard, this higher bar that, that healthcare providers are expected, uh, required maybe, uh, to, to meet. So awesome. Charles, you're up. What, uh, what do you think is the importance of ethics in healthcare? Yeah, I think as it was previously stated, I mean, in a healthcare position, we were dealing with individuals and their lives. Um, so, I mean, as we said, stated before, really broadly, the definition of ethics was really just to do the right thing. Um, it goes another level when you're talking about an individual, uh, their personal goals, their beliefs, you know, what really motivates them, what clicks with them. How are we going to help them attain what they want? Why are they here to, why are they here to see us um, as healthcare providers? And, and taking that into account um, really forces the, like, um, Michael, that's the power differential, right? So we really need to have that standpoint of we understand why you're here to see us and um, we're going to value and put everything forward that we can and you are going to believe and trust in us that we're going to do the right thing for you. Yeah, for sure. So let's take it a step further now. Let's, you know, we're all educators, right? We all have, have a little bit of background in teaching and learning, right? What are some of the best ways that you guys teach ethics? What are some of the ways that, you know, uh, you've seen really work when it comes to educating our students um, on, on ethics as far as like best practices go? And either one of you can well, go well, first. I'll answer this first. Yeah. I enjoy doing like an ethics, um, an ethics activity with the students in which we'll kind of give them a situation, almost like a case study, and determine how would they react and what would the outcomes be. I mean, having a little bit of a debate in the classroom. Um, really them getting to see the other side of it. What I really like to tell students is to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, when they do that, they view everything and including the world around them in a different perspective. So it's not just their perception of what healthcare is, but it's that patient's perception of what healthcare is as well. And they need to understand both aspects of that. I like yeah. it. Yeah, definitely. The, I think a case-based approach is, mm -hmm. is, is essential. And, you know, it, it's great because, you, you might have a, a class that's not necessarily too into debating the various issues you're talking about, but as soon as you get to an ethical issue, the level of engagement almost consistently year over year just rises. People want to contribute to a dialogue about what's right or what's wrong about a situation. Um, and so, you know, I think that that case-based approach is really fertile ground for good discussion. I, mean, I like that Charles talked about, you know, a, a class activity, a group activity where, you know, assignments and things like that, I think need to be at least in pairs, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is, you know, to discuss, debate, decide on ethical issues and do that, you know, as an N of one is really not going to be as productive right. as making it a, at least a, a pair, if not larger group type of activity. Yeah, I like that because at the very least you can assign one one of each side of the the coin to to each of them. So I like that. Um, well, let's talk about that, Michael. Like he said, when things go bad, 
ethically speaking, what do we do if things start heading south? What do we do when when things get heated and and there's, you know, pretty, you know, strong debate over an ethical issue? Like, you know, how do we handle that? Well, hopefully there's a dividing line between when there's a, a big issue and once it goes bad, right? And, you know, the idea would be that you you sense the potential ethical hazards in advance before things go south. Of course, sometimes you get thrown into situations and, you know, you're new to it and it's already a, a, a mess. But, you know, I, I think giving students the tools for trying to just understand the ethical lay of the land, um, I think is a great place to start. And one of the things, and maybe going back to the last question a little bit about, about teaching ethics is trying to uh, introduce students to not just the code of ethics, right? Because the code of ethics is pretty highly specific with regard to, um, you know, specific behaviors, duties, expectations, and the sub rules are kind of, you know, examples, but, but getting them more just familiar with the general ethical principles and duties that are out there in terms of looking at things through a more general lens of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and those sorts of things, um, I think is is helpful to simplify it because the code of ethics, I mean, it's, you know, there's eight principles. They're pretty detailed. Like that's something where you, I don't know that anybody knows the code of ethics off the top of their head. I certainly right. don't. Yeah. Right? I know, something I'd have to look up for sure. Yeah. So I, you know, I think part of it is just, is, is taking that 20,000 foot view of it, um, you know, from a general ethical duties and principle standpoint is, is kind of a good place to start. Charles, how about you, man? How do you handle things if if we get to an ethical dilemma and things are really starting to go south? How do you kind of try to reel it back in? What are some tips or tricks that you use? So I think, uh, you know, as Mike has mentioned again with the APTA Code of Ethics, there are eight principles there and they're set in place as like the do nots of what we are supposed to do as a profession within physical therapy. Um, and the Code of Ethics really identifies like the moral rules that the members must follow. But what it comes down to and what I've found, um, typically there's always a dilemma between what is moral and what is ethical. And really that ethical standpoint is it's connected with that philosophical theory, whereas a moral is more connected to like an individual action. Um, and helping students see the difference between what is moral and what is considered ethical really seems to iron out any, any uh, conflicts that may arise, especially during activities like I mentioned before. Ethics being that way of understanding and examining moral life, not necessarily just the morality and, and of customs and behaviors found in society. So uh, overall, there's really a standpoint between like choices um, that we have and that we make and what to do with what is considered to be, say, morally right or morally wrong. So we talked a little bit about some teaching activities and tools and things that we can use to educate our patients, our patients, our students on ethics. But how do we really take things a step further? And this is kind of going to be like a two part question here, because I want to see this from both the student side of things as well as the um, professor side of things. Right. Or other educators. How do we instill a good layer of ethics within our students? And then how do we work that same level of ethics into our professors and, and our peers and colleagues? So uh, Charles, why don't you start us off there with the uh, the student side of things, and then we'll get Michael's take. So it really depends on what motivates the students. Um, so that is like a class-based um, analysis that is kind of performed based off of their learning styles and, and really seeing what gets them to tick. Um, and what I've found a majority of students really cling to, especially because they are students who are spending an enormous amount of time studying and, and taking exams and preparing for that final board exam. Um, when they finally do get that license, they never want it taken away from them. And really kind of informing them that, hey, this is an ethical dilemma, or this might be an ethical situation. And if you don't necessarily act on this the correct way or put the patient first, um, if you perform anything that may be unethical, even in terms of an administrative or managerial role, um, that license can be taken away from you. And students really have their eyes open uh, when they, they hear that because they kind of understand and realize all that time and effort um, and investment that they put into their college education can be wiped away very quickly. So I believe that would answer the first part of your question as far as what I've seen and what I really feel motivates uh, the students. But to take that even a step further, 
we really talk about a lot of moral core, um, moral courage in the classroom as well, and really standing up for their beliefs and standing up for the APTA code of ethics and for their patients. Mostly what I have found from feedback from students, even in uh, during some clinical rotations or as professionals at postgraduate, um, they might not be the ones committing an unethical act or performing an unethical act, but they may be witnessing that unethical act. And, and the standpoint is, how do you have that moral courage to take that the step further? Um, what are you to do in those situations? Yeah, that's huge, too, because, you know, I, I actually consider moral courage as part of advocacy as well. You know, it's one way that you can advocate. I was just talking about this over the weekend uh, at ELC that, you know, advocacy isn't just putting on a suit and tie and going up to DC and shaking hands and kissing babies with, you know, the the lawmakers. Like there's several different ways to advocate and and that's for ourselves, for our profession and for our patients. And, And having that moral compass and being able to stand up and say, hey, this isn't right is advocating for the person in the situation, whether it be ourselves or, or somebody in the profession or a patient. Uh, you know, so I think that's a, a really great point. Uh, Michael, what about you? What are your thoughts on, on uh, you know, how yeah. we instill those ethics in the students? I think to, to help them see ethics is not just the big things, right? Like there are the catchy, big ethical decisions that get made in healthcare, right? So some of the, the, uh, hospitals in New Orleans right after Hurricane Katrina, where there were legitimate, you know, challenging issues related to distributive justice, or more recently, right, with COVID and mechanical ventilator shortages and things like that, where, you know, there these are big sort of ethical decisions that providers are making. And, you know, the likelihood of uh, a PT being in some of those really, you know, high high magnitude, high profile you know, high risk, high consequence ethical scenarios is really low, but helping them to see how ethics is really infused through all aspects of practice, right? Coming, you know, even all the way down to coding and billing, right? And and understanding that, you know, as I look at the clock or don't look at the clock for how long I even, you know, was in a patient's room, that's going to be a reflection of your moral courage, right, that Charles was talking about. And so I I think that's really important, or even, you know, the simple act of deciding which patients are going to be seen on a weekend, right, when when your facility doesn't have enough staff. Like, there's ethical decision-making that goes into that, and to approach that as strictly an administrative task or a clinical task without appreciating and reflecting upon the the ethical implications of that, um, I think, you know, students are are going to be missing something that's important. So once you sort of help them see that, oh, wait a minute, there's a whole lot more here to my decision-making in clinical practice, um, I I think it helps them appreciate the attention, give give it the need to give it attention that it deserves. Yeah. Well, Michael, let's go a little further then. How do we instill it into, you know, other professors, peers, our colleagues, people that we work with, you know, how do we take it to that level? Because now we're, we're on the same level. It's not like a, you know, a, teacher educating patients or, or students rather, you know, how do we yeah. do that uh, to others around us? I, you know, that's tough, right? I mean, when it comes down to ethics, especially when it comes to billing and coding issues, and you guys have seen this, right? Your students are exposed to all kinds of billing and coding practices, right? From the, you know, hey, that's that's maybe a little stretch to that's making something gray that's really not gray to, wow, that's that's borderline on on waste and fraud, it's easy to get pious, right? And I think piety, when it comes to ethics, turns a lot of people off. And so, you know, as we're trying to promote this in others, including our colleagues and our, you know, our peers in the clinic and our fellow faculty members, um, I think is in asking questions, right? Um, And facilitating and promoting reflection on a given scenario, whatever it might be, and maybe even humility too, right? To share stories where maybe we didn't make the right decision um, and to model the process of reflection on decision-making, you know, expertise in area, any area, whether it's, you know, something that's specifically clinical or it's expertise in, in ethical decision-making comes from reflective experience and making mistakes. And so I think 
trying to avoid that that piety and understanding that you know these decisions are not easy decisions even when they seem simple they're still not easy easy decisions so yeah that's a great takeaway there because i think you know trying to avoid that holier than thou and, and throwing stones at glass houses thing it's like that's not going to solve anything right you just have to have the conversation like you said open it with questions and just kind of say hey uh, you know, could you explain to me more about, you know, how, how you're doing that, what what that looks like to you and why, you know, why you might be using that, you know, bill or code or whatever, right? That's a, a really good way to open it, I think, and keep it at a, at a you know, equal level and not uh, come down on somebody, you know, it's, uh, it, it's just kind of taking it from a nice, nice, uh, neutral kind of point of view and just kind of trying to understand and learn more. So I like, I like that approach. Uh, Charles, how about you? What do you think about uh, how we can instill those ethics or help with instilling ethics in our peers and our, our other professors and coworkers? Yeah, so I mean, to expand on top of just physical therapy, and we work with other professionals on a daily yeah. basis um, yeah. in our fields. And, and depending on the setting that the physical therapy practicing is practicing in would probably depend on the amount or frequency that they are interacting with other individuals. Um, but taking that all into perspective, what it really comes down to is like a multidisciplinary or ethical team um, and really highlighting kind of what Michael had said and going off of that is that these ethical teams, these multidisciplinary teams, um, they should treat each case of an ethical situation or unethical situation just as unique as we talk or treat about the patients or treat the patients that we are discussing on a, a, a weekly basis, whether it be in our case conference or, or weekly uh, meetings. Um, because every case, case in ethical uh, situations is unique. And when it comes down to that, every member of that team really should have an equal amount of time to voice their side of the issue that is at hand. And that includes all stakeholders, not only the professionals that are involved, but also even say the patient or the family. In terms of that, going a step further is really just being sensitive to that cultural or religious belief of the patient as well, because that can play a huge role into ethical situations. Um, in today's world, I believe we have to be more sensitive to that than we ever have before. So, yeah, I mean, that can really bring up some some interesting, you know, power battles there, right? If you have, a, let's say, a doctor who's writing orders for a therapist and a therapist is seeing something that the doctor maybe is doing unethical and, you know, you wonder like, hey, I don't want to step on his toes, especially if he, it feels like he's over me. Right. Even worse, a student in that position. Right. A student physical therapist walks in and a doctor's in there doing something unethical. You know, the student's like, well, what do I do? I'm just a student. I don't want to, you know, squeal on the doc. But at the same time, they're not doing something ethical. So that's a really tough, you know, power balance and power struggle there. So I think it's tough. And we talk about that in the classroom as well, like being new graduates for the most part, uh, coming out and, and working that first full time physical therapy job. Um, again, that's where that moral courage comes into play, but also using like the APTA's decision-making framework. Yeah. Um, that can take a student very far, a new graduate or even uh, a, severe, uh, a tenured uh, practitioner uh, very far as far as um, determining what to do in a situation and, and how to handle things. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, again, at the end of the day, right, it, it's tough because if you don't report it, if you don't say something, you're almost you know being complicit with it. You're almost allowing it which makes you kind of borderline guilty as well. You know, it's like guilty by association kind of thing. So that, that moral courage becomes even more important, you know, doing the right thing has to be the right thing. It's just always, you know, well, I've got one more question before we get to our final takeaway here, but what is it that got you guys so interested in ethics? What makes you so passionate about it as a topic? Why do you guys love this? Why did, why did, why do you get so jazzed up about ethics? Michael, we'll let you start it off. Yeah, I think it, it just stems from who I am as a person. And I think, I think everybody listening here is going to, this will resonate with them. When you think about the types of people who become physical therapists, right? There's a, there's a profile there of people who want to be patient centered and who care about other people and who care about getting other people better. Right. I mean, you know, every, every, Every PT school candidate, why do you want to go into PT? Because I want to help people, right? So there's a disposition there. And I think this is just one manifestation of that, of that natural disposition, you know, wanting to be able to articulate um, how I go about making decisions. And 
um, the way in which considering ethics impacts my ability to care for patients, right? And and I it's it's interesting as I think about the connections between and Charles, you you got into this a little bit, you know, patient centered care and cultural competence are heavily rooted in ethics, right? And so just the, the art of caring for people is inseparable for ethics. And so I, I think that's to me why why it's it's so exciting to me is you can't you can't separate from that um, as you think about doing that which we love, which is taking care of people. Yeah, for sure. How about you, Charles? What uh, what fires you up about ethics? I think it's just it's like Mike had said, it's just instilled in in, in me since you know just a, a young kid growing up. Um, I was trying, like I said, to do the right thing. Really, I feel like a lot of these values that I gained were from my experience in the Boy Scouts um, growing up and, and really contributing that to the individuals around us that we served um, in the community. So by doing service projects and, and just the greater good for, for the humankind and going on to that with physical therapy, like we are in it to help people. And if we're not in it for the for any other reason, like why are we physical therapists? And if we are in physical therapy to assist and help people attain what they want to do it and we're doing it in an unethical manner, there's a huge disconnect there. So it's taking a standpoint and going a little bit further on top of that is if I'm one person and if I feel that way and I can teach this, a class of 50 uh, students that, you know, they're going to go out and expand upon that as well. So not to get too, too in depth or off topic, but in today's society, I feel like there's a lot of misinformation that we are not sure is, is correct that we hear. And, and there's all this fact checking going on and um, are we being deceived in certain aspects and avenues of what we're hearing? And to stand as a healthcare professional, like we do not need that in our profession. Um, that does not belong. That does not live in the physical therapy world. It's, I mean, it's only going to make things worse. You know, it's we're already battling an uphill battle. We don't need it getting, you know, getting worse for sure. So that makes a lot of sense, you know, and I didn't even think about it, but like, I, I did my dissertation on on service based learning, right? So like doing community service projects to tie in learning and stuff, right? Well, I don't. I've always just kind of done community service, not not like a ton, like it's not my everyday thing. It's just something that I try to find and do projects here and there when I can, when you know something pops up in the local community or something. And the uh, the reason I kind of followed through with that for my dissertation was because I wanted my kids to kind of see me live out community service, right? And service-based learning stuff fit in very well for that. But I was also, I didn't think about this, but I, I was in the Cub Scouts for a while as well, you know? Uh, and, and you just think about all the things and the teachings that they had and Scouts Honor, right? And how it's like so important to just do the right thing. So like, there, there are definitely like little links to that stuff way back from when you're a kid, you know, and you don't even recognize it. And I, I my parents did a phenomenal job with my brother and I, I think, raising us and just you know, always trying to do the right thing and care for others and, and help others. And, and and that's what I think led to most of us trying to become physical therapists, right? Try to help people, right? you know? So those of us in healthcare do care, you know, we, we do want to help people. So you would hope that uh, it, it's, you're in it for the right reasons, but then, you know, a, a few bad apples tend to, to ruin it for us and give us that uphill battle. So now we've got to make sure that we keep fighting the good fight, so to speak, uh, so that we're, we're staying on the straight and narrow and trying to show people that, you know, no, it, it is mostly good. Trust us, you know? Well, thank you so much, you guys, for taking your time and for coming on to talk about all things ethics in the, our healthcare world. I have one final question that we ask all guests. And that last question is, if you could change one aspect of higher education, whether it be DPT or otherwise, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? Charles, we'll start with you anything you want. So as um, we started off with stating, I'm fairly new to the higher education world. Don't know that I would have a, a really good answer for this one. Um, so far, I've loved everything that I've experienced about it. I do think, you know, one thing I try to incorporate, and I'm not sure if it's completed or incorporated in other institutions and programs, but really would be that active learning standpoint. I feel like the students gain much more out of a lecture and out of a classroom experience with active learning techniques utilized in the classroom um, over you know, lecture, PowerPoint presentation materials, um, really putting that case-by-case -case basis and case studies into all aspects of the physical therapy program uh, will really help them to resonate with their uh, the information that is being taught that day. So I hope yeah. that 
Yeah, no, that's awesome. We actually are seeing that a lot more too, even in conferences, right? So uh, instead of that sage on a stage where they just get up there at the podium and speak for an hour or two hours, right? And everybody just sits there and passively listens. Just this weekend at ELC, I had one present presentation accepted that had a good amount of active learning activities in it and another one that was rejected because it didn't have enough active mm -hmm. learning activities in it. So uh, you know, and, and it did. Our talk went very well just because we had people up and walking around and getting in groups and sharing things and stuff. Uh, and, and that was really helpful. We got some really good discussion at the end by, by the group sharing. And, uh, you know, we're movement experts. And here we are sitting in chairs all day listening to people's, you know, presentations. So we, we should try to do something about that, right, and change things up. So, Michael, how about yourself? What, uh, what would you change? How would you change? Uh, I think... My my initial reaction, I mean, there's lots of, I think, directions we could go with that question, but my initial reaction is this simply straight up cost yep. and accessibility, um, which is just going to continue to narrow the pool of individuals who can attend PT school, right? Mm -hmm. So I just fear that PT school is going to, or PT as a profession is going to be, you know, the profession for those with privilege and power, um, which just further separates us as professionals from the realities that the majority of our fa patients face in their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, I, I just, I think we've got to, I don't know what forces it's going to take to to turn that around. Um, but I just, I feel like, I feel the most helpless when it comes to that. Yeah. Well, cost is the number one most given answer. Uh, it's a, a very common issue. And uh, luckily, uh, that was our, our presentation over the weekend was on financial literacy and uh, how we can kind of start helping with that. Uh, but it is a multifactorial issue we found, obviously, yeah. especially there was two or three talks on on cost of DPT programs this weekend. So we know it's a problem. We're trying to address it, uh, and the CAPD transparency uh, thing that they're kind of releasing, where all the schools have to release their numbers as far as what their tuition is, cost of living, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's a good start, but it's it's not the only thing. We need to help on the advocacy side of things, and and uh, you know, uh, APTA has to keep fighting the Medicare cuts and make sure we're getting reimbursed what we're actually worth, so that the salaries can kind of start going up instead of staying stagnant. The universities have to definitely make uh, everything transparent and work on trying to lower their costs overall. But again, they're going to have a bottom line, right? They're going to have a number that they have to to operationally get get by. Um, and then, last but not least, we have to start showing our our students and the the future wave of therapists that there are other options out there than just clock in, clock out, nine to five therapist. You know, you can make money doing other things using your skill sets as a physical therapist. So. I think if we, we we incorporate a lot of those, um, we can start working on it. But it's definitely a huge problem right now that we're having to address. And then, you know, the, just one other thought, the tension between, you know, the cost, right? And so students feeling compelled to work while they're in PT school and while they're in really rigorous programs, right? And programs that have trouble deciding what to cut out. You know, and as, as we have different, uh, you know, documents coming out about entry level competencies and as faculty, we look at those lists and we're like, oh, my goodness, I got to teach this, too. Right. This is what my peers consider to be entry level. Where do I fit that in? What do I cut that out? And I think we tend to err on the side of adding more, which just adds to student burden, student stress and their inability to successfully negotiate a program while also trying to work and make money because financially it's the only way they can make it happen. So yeah, no easy yeah. answers. No, for sure. And I mean, you know, we try, I think St. Augustine tried to address that by creating our flex program, which stretches it out over four years. So it gives them a little more time to take the information in and allow us to incorporate some more stuff and allows the students to kind of work a little bit as they, as they go through the program. But then you're still looking at four years, whereas the other end of the spectrum, you have, you know, uh, some South College and Baylor and some of those that are trying to compress the program and get it done quicker so that they can get out and work quicker, you know, and it's like, I don't know that there's a right answer, but, you know, we're trying different things and we're trying to figure out what's going to work best. And maybe we need a couple different options for sure, which is why, you know, that's that's a good thing. But also we have to be careful of how many options we have. You know, if we start getting too many PT programs out there, we're going to become oversaturated, too. So. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. I don't know the answer, but that's why you guys are on here, man. Great minds trying to start the conversations and have those ideas to, to, you know, figure this out because uh, we need great thinkers with open minds to start uh, putting out ideas. So thank you gentlemen, both for your time and for coming on and for educating the audience. Uh, where can people find you online or if they just want to follow up and see, you know, have more questions or ask what you guys are up to um, Charles, where, where are you located? Where can they find you? Sure. So if you were to Google search uh, Lebanon Valley College and their physical therapy department uh, faculty, I'm listed there uh, with email contact provided as well, but it is salvo at lvc.edu. And awesome. I'm willing to uh, answer any questions. Great. Michael, you? Yeah, the uh, gvsu.edu uh, physical therapy page on there. It's My email is uh, S H O E M A M I at G V S U dot E D U. Awesome. And we'll put those links in the show notes so people can find you easily. Thank you guys so much for your time and for coming on to share your knowledge with us. Absolutely. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. A lot of fun. Thank you.